and you're here at Straight Science, which is an evening presentation series here at Northwest Campus. This is the uh, Northwest Campus building. And uh, I am with UAF Alaska Sea Grant and together we put on the Straight Science series. Um, both UAF Northwest Campus and UAF Alaska Sea Grant serve the Bering Strait region. So we're public servants really for the Bering Strait region which is the homeland and waters of the Yupik, Inupiaq, and St. Lawrence Island Yupik peoples. So tonight, before I do the introduction, I wanna let the speakers know and all of you know that we have at least here on campus been having an internet outage, which was causing me some gray hairs, but we are on and that's good. If for some reason Gnome goes down, Aaron and Michael have the capacity to keep going in Seattle. So they've got some better internet. I don't know what may happen to the rest of you or where you're calling in, but if for some reason there is some technical problem, Mike and Aaron just keep on a chugging and we will do all we can <laughs> to back in and then join you. Just saying right. that because that happened earlier today here in Nome. I don't know about anyone else, but campus was down for uh, over an hour. So um, welcome everybody. And tonight's speakers, it's actually a very good topic talking about ice seals. We have uh, weak ice. I was able to come in off St. Lawrence Island this afternoon and there is an awful lot of gray ice between here and St. Lawrence Island, which doesn't look like it will last too long. So we have uh, interesting conditions. And Mike Cameron, who will be tonight's first speaker, and then we're going to do questions. He leads the NOAA Polar Ecosystems Program, which is the research arm for uh, all of the bearded seals, ring seals, ribbon seals, and spotted seals in our region. And he's talking to us from Seattle, and he's part of the Marine Mammal Lab, which is the NOAA Alaska Fisheries Science Center in Seattle, but he's at home. That isn't his office at work. <laughs> uh, and Erin will be our second speaker and we'll have questions for her and she is the senior ice seal biologist with the Polar Ecosystems Program. They're going to talk about <clears throat> some of their highlights, that what they've learned. They're going to talk about um, what they're doing this spring and what they're about to embark on. And then I just, just in the preamble, while we were visiting, we're actually going to hear a tiny little bit about polar bears. So that was kind of exciting and a little bonus that we're going to get. With that, if anybody, if we have a caller, we don't have any callers yet, but callers, as you know, will get priority because that means it's, uh, people aren't able to, they won't be able to see the pictures and they're likely calling in from a remote location. Can't think of anything else we need to say. And I'm really looking forward to hearing about ice seals. This is the time of year that it's all gonna turn to the seals and to the walrus. So for tonight, we're gonna hear about the seals Take it away, Mike Cameron. Thank you so much. All right, thank you very much. I will take charge here. Looks good. You're not in presentation mode, but. Yes. How's that? You are, you look brilliant. All right, take it away. Right. All right, thank you. Well. Gay, you did a, such a great job of the introduction. I'm going to be able to skip over the next, the first few slides very quickly. So uh, we're here to talk about some of our previous results and our plans for 2022. My name is Michael Cameron. I'm the leader of the Polar Ecosystems Program uh, in Seattle. Um, many of you may know the name Peter Boving. Peter Boving was the leader of the Polar Ecosystems Program for decades. He's actually still with our program, but uh, getting ready to retire, starting to phase out. So I, uh, he's still with our program, uh, leading up a statistics group, um, but i am been named the new leader. And Aaron Moreland, um, as we just learned, was also gonna be speaking. And as we also just learned, <clears throat> uh, our program, the Polar Ecosystems Program, uh, conducts research on the four species of ice-associated seals, ribbon, spotted, ringed, and bearded seal, as well as the harbor seal in Alaskan waters. So all of the phocid seals, the true seals in Alaskan waters. That said, I'm mostly just going to be talking about the ice-associated seals for this uh, presentation. So the work that we do is really part of a, a three-pronged approach, or maybe a four-pronged approach to monitoring seals um, in Alaska. 
The first prong, the most important prong, of course, is uh, the residents, you, of the coastal communities. They're the eyes and ears and often the first folks to detect, to detect changes in the marine mammals and seabirds. In particular, we know that hunters are frequently out observing the environment and we really rely on all of those observations. Uh, the next prong, it would be the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Uh, they work with hunters to collect samples from harvested seals, to compile a lot of those hunters' observations about the health and status they analyze reproductive success and growth rates, diet, disease, contaminants. Uh, a lot of that comes from um, the work that they do with the Alaska Native Harvest. And that is the second prong. The third prong, I would say, would be us, uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service, or just NOAA Fisheries. We tend to conduct more broad area population surveys of seals uh, to determine the population abundance and trends and large scale movements. The surveys that we do are somewhat new and are also just sort of starting to yield some of the first reliable numbers for abundance and, and other estimates of um, diving behavior and, popu and population dynamics and um, body condition uh, range wide. Um, we do this primarily by conducting aerial surveys, which Aaron is going to be talking about, and also a number of vessel-based or village-based um, tracking and sampling projects. We also have a strong statistical group, which is heavily involved in developing new methods, uh, both for surveying and also for being able to interpret those data um, to be able to help us get uh, appropriate estimates. So as I mentioned, I'm going to be talking mostly about our vessel-based work today. Um, in this case, this is the work that we do usually aboard the NOAA ship Oscar Dyson um, at the marginal ice zone in the Bering Sea pack ice. Um, early on in our program's history, um, every year from 2005 to 10, we would be going to the um, sea ice edge in the summer to be able to tag and sample seals. Starting in 2014, we moved into uh, springtime surveys to pay more attention to mothers and their pups on the flows. Uh, in 2014, 16, and 18, uh, we went out. In 2020, we had hoped to go out. I think I gave a presentation just before that cruise uh, was unfortunately canceled for COVID. I'm hoping we don't have a repeat of that. Uh, we are intending to go out um, actually in about two weeks. Um, and I'll be telling a little bit more about that later in the presentation. Uh, because we're working out at the marginal ice zone in the Bering in uh, spring, mostly the seals that we're encountering out there are ribbon and spotted seals. Uh, we want ultimately to understand how many seals there are in the population, um, what their seasonal movements are, if they're healthy, and most importantly, and a lot of what I'll be talking about today is how they're responding to changes in their habitat, which folks from Nome don't need any reminding. Uh, in order to capture the seals for our sampling and tagging, uh, we use the Oscar ship uh, Oscar Dyson uh, to go out to the ice edge. We will launch uh, small inflatable boats, quietly, stealthily move through the pack ice until we can jump out onto an ice flow with a seal, hopefully unaware, and capture it uh, using a handheld net, like you see here. After capturing a seal, we'll, as I mentioned, be attaching satellite link tracking tags. These are useful for movements, dive behavior, and also for helping us to understand um, the timing of haul out. Haul out is when an animal comes out of the water. This is important for uh, being able to make corrections for our aerial abundance estimates. When we fly over a seal on the ice, we know that there are plenty of seals in the water that we can't see. So we use the information from these tags to help us correct those abundance estimates. In addition, we'll weigh, measure, and sample, uh, meaning drawing blood, blubber, hair, take photographs, do a variety of uh, health and condition estimates of the seals to see how healthy they are. Ultimately, again, we're interested in how they may be impacted by the changing ecosystems. 
just a couple slides here showing some of the results of uh, our work. These little spaghetti plots, as we call them, are basically just showing the, the movements that we've been able to track some of our tag seals. Just giving an example of how wide ranging so many of these animals can go. This is an example of what our data looks like for haul out. Um, hauling out again is the uh, time of day that and the percent of that hour that they're hauled out onto the ice. This is just an example of what those data look like. Uh, the color indicates um, how much, what percent of that hour uh, the tag was dry. And so saying what percent of that hour the seal was, uh, how much of that percent of the hour the seal was hauled out. And then diving behavior, these satellite tags have records that indicate pressure, which is a proxy for uh, depth. And we use this uh, to be able to indicate where in the water column they're diving to and presumably feeding, which is useful for um, ecosystem studies and habitat use. Um, in, mo in most of our years, going back to at least 2004, uh, the work where we would be conducting most of our captures would be in the brown and the green circles there. Uh, ovals in the lower left-hand corner, just sort of off of St. Matthew Island. Uh, but in 2018, um, as you might remember, the sea ice in April was dramatically reduced, forcing us to occupy areas uh, hundreds of kilometers farther north than in our previous years. 2018 and also 2019 were actually um, record years for low sea ice in the bearing of the recent history. But although they were record for recent, uh, they are actually sort of a case study for the future. Um, most of the models that are looking at um, estimates of where the sea ice edge will be in the future um, because of the impacts of global warming and climate change put the sort of levels that we were seeing in 2018 um, to be more or less normal by the end of the century. So in 2018, we had an example to sort of see what the Bering Sea was going to look like and how the ecosystem might be responding to it, sort of a natural experiment. April, of course, is crucial for seals in the Bering Sea uh, because they are the reproductive grounds for populations of all species of ice-associated seals. Combined, they total well over a million individuals. Um, a change, therefore, in ice-covered areas in April likely has implications for all of the populations of ice seals in the Bering Sea. And this, again, is just a, another sort of example. Um, our usual sort of sea ice um, and where we operate is on the left-hand corner in 2012. Um, 2018 is how low the sea ice was in April of 2018. Well, we know that there were changes uh, already that had occurred in 2018. The, probably the most obvious was the unusual mortality event, or uh, UNE, that occurred from 2018 and 2019. Uh, well over uh, almost 300 bearded ringed spotted seals and others uh, have, were washed up on beaches all along the Bering and Chukchi Seas. Many of them, uh, some were dead, many of them were young and emaciated uh, with alopecia, losing hair, sores and the rest of it. This was quite a bit higher than the normal numbers of seals that were washed up, uh, prompting NOAA to declare an uh, unusual mortality event, which allowed for additional study. So there's lots of reasons um, that we can imagine that a loss of sea ice could be impacting these populations. These seals use sea ice in order to haul out onto to give birth to their young. Um, so they use sea ice as a platform. So less sea ice might indicate um, less ice available for giving birth on. Similarly, less area available for pups to, for moms to be able to nurse their pups or to rest in order to get their skin temperature up uh, to an appropriate level in order to uh, molt. Molting is a very important part of a ice seal's life history. Uh, by getting their skin temperature up, they're able to uh, lose their fur 
um, quickly and then regrow it again, which uh, is important, we believe, in uh, health and condition, being able to shed from disease and parasites. Uh, but also, you can imagine that poor nutrition and reduced body condition uh, could be impacted by a reduction in sea ice. So we had the research question, are there trends in the body conditions of seals in Alaska that might reflect ecosystem changes during this period of rapid environmental change? There's lots of ways that you can look at uh, body condition, uh, but we chose to look at it in a couple different ways. Uh, the first is just basically looking at the ratio of seals the ratio of their mass or their weight uh, relative to their standard length. The idea here being that the standard length of a seal doesn't change much um, throughout uh, its life or at least from one year to the next, as, at least as long as they're adults. But their mass, their weight, how fat they are, will be changing from year to year, likely based on the relationship of energy in, energy out. So in years with um, poor availability to food or in years in which they have to um, exert more energy, you might expect they would have a lower mass to their standard length ratio. Uh, the other uh, metric that we looked at is just measuring the blubber thickness. Um, this is uh, Heather Zeal and she's using an ultrasound uh, device, the same device that a doctor might use to uh, check on a mother's baby, a mother's fetus. Uh, we, you can use this device in order to actually measure the thickness um, of the blubber at uh, various spots. For both of those uh, metrics, we recognized a, uh, a decline um, in the last few years from 2014 to 2018. We didn't have a lot of data, however, from those animals. So later we were able to go back at all of the uh, information that we've been collecting since back to 2007. And we did a large meta study uh, combining information from ribbon seals, spotted seals, and also uh, harbor seals in the Aleutian Islands at varieties of locations. Upwards of uh, almost 300 uh, individuals we were able to put into this study. So just looking specifically at the um, relationship between uh, mass and length, uh, we noticed that body condition declined from 2007 to 2018. We also noticed that uh, the body condition of pups in all of the species um, declined. Perhaps this is because of poor nutrition for the mothers during gestation or nursing or both. Uh, the body condition of subadults and adults declined in ribbon seals, but not in spotted seals. So this is an interesting thing. One possibility, of course, is that we know that ribbon seals prefer to forage in particularly deep water off of the shelf. So in years in which the sea ice edge is not close to the shelf break, they would presumably have to travel farther in order to reach what we assume might be their more preferred um, foraging areas. As such, they'd have to expend more energy to get their food. As such, you might expect their mass to be uh, lower than during a year where sea ice was at its normal extent. So we were able to answer the research question based on these data, at least. Um, there is a trend in the body condition of seals in Alaska, but we still don't know why. And to do that, we need to gather more information. Before I go to the next slide, I'd just like to mention that um, the data from the Alaska Department of Fish and Game that they've been able to collect from the subsistence harvest samples have shown that in some species and age classes, that body condition hasn't declined. And in fact, in some ways of looking at it, has increased. There's reasons for that that, well, there are reasons we suspect why there might be differences, either times of year or locations where the samples are being taken. All of those differences are what gets scientists excited to be able, because it's those sorts of natural experiments that allow us to understand the ecosystem better. So we intend to be and have been working with the Alaskan Department of Fish and Game to try and understand the discrepancies between those two data sets. Um, but getting back to this work, we need to be able to collect more data. 
So catching a large numbers of seals is, as you can imagine, challenging and expensive, and it takes a long time. And ultimately, we end up just getting relatively small sample sizes of tens of animals uh, per year when we go out. The fewer animals we have, the less ability we have to make uh, good statistical inferences. So we wanted to find a way in which to gather a lot more information on body condition faster and cheaper. Luckily, other researchers have uh, shown that it is possible to estimate length and predict mass using images collected from an uncrewed aerial system or UAS. So we are intending to try that uh, this year. So our first objective was to use an unmanned aircraft to photograph seals that are hauled out uh, of the water onto ice and then being able to estimate body condition using measurements we can collect from that image. And I'll go into that in a second. Our second goal that we're hopeful for, but not quite sure how well it's gonna work. As Aaron's gonna mention, we have uh, hundreds, tens of thousands of images of seals that we've already taken from um, our aerial abundance surveys. If we might be able to apply some of what we've learned uh, from the unmanned aircraft work, to these images, we'd greatly be able to increase our sample size. Even if the resolution isn't great, with thousands and thousands of samples, uh, we'll have the statistical power, we hope, uh, to be able to make other inferences. So the first phase of our work um, was to understand the best way to do this. Um, we again need to know the different, we need to be able to measure or estimate or predict length and mass just by looking at a photo of something. Um, if you know the altitude at which you're taking a picture from or the distance of something you're taking a picture from, and if you know the specifications of the lens and the sensor of the camera you're using, you can know the size of each pixel that the camera takes, the size on the ground. And therefore, just by counting the number of pixels to be able to get a length, you can then ratchet that up to be able to estimate the total length um, of the seal in your photo. And that turns out to be fairly straightforward as long as you have a good way of estimating your altitude and know your sensor specs. Um, the second item we need to be able to look at for body condition is mass. Obviously, we can't directly uh, weigh the animal with a photograph, but what we can do is look at the, an estimate of the volume or an estimate of the silhouette, basically the shadow of a seal. And from that, we can identify relationships um, to the mass of the animal. Uh, in order to do that, though, we need to be able to have access to seals that we can reliably weigh and measure in order to develop those statistical models. Phase two then uh, has had us uh, visiting a number of captive care facilities that have ice seals. These captive care facilities um, frequently weigh and measure these seals and they can be trained to hold different body positions so that we can also adjust our models um, for being able to estimate lengths and mass from images based on different body positions of the seals. The two captive care facilities are at the Long Marine Lab at the University of California at Santa Cruz, where they have two bearded seals and one ring seal, and at the Alaska Sea Life Center in Seward, uh, where they have three spotted seals and at least two ring seals. They have a few more ring seals. They're not quite ready. They're not quite sure if they're ready for, if they're trained yet to be able to work with us. Because we're interested in changes of um, body condition, uh, we're going to plan to be visiting um, both of these locations in the summer when seals are at their leanest, and also again in the late fall when seals are at their fattest. We don't expect their lengths to be changing much uh, during this time, so changes in the fatness of the seals is what we're hoping to be able to detect. And then from that, again, we can develop the models that we can then apply to be able to estimate uh, mass or body condition from. We were able to go to the Long Marine Lab uh, last fall, and here is an example of one of our sample tests. 
uh, sample images from the unmanned aircraft, uncrewed aircraft of a uh, ring seal hauled out onto the deck. And you have a known scale scale bar there right next to it in the inset. And we also have a, a resolution plot off to the, the right hand side. This just gives you an example of the sort of imagery that we expect to get. These are called nadir images or images taken uh, straight down. And from this, because we know the actual lengths of these seals and because we know the actual widths at different locations and because we know the masses of these seals, we should be able to develop our geostatistical models. Phase three is what we plan to do uh, in April. Uh, we have a 23-day research expedition aboard the Oscar Dyson to the Bering Sea. Um, we will be conducting the field tests of the entire uh, uncrewed system, launching from sea ice, from small boats, and from the Oscar Dyson, collecting images of uh, seals hauled out on the sea ice. Hopefully, we'll also be able to get some other pup pairs, and we'll be able to confirm whether or not how well the drone works in polar environments. Uh, we will, of course, be continuing the same work that we've been doing since 2005, uh, jumping out onto ice flows, well, sneaking through slowly, quietly moving through ice flows to capture seals, uh, and then be able to tag and sample them. Our hope is that a number of the animals that we're able to photograph are the same animals that we're going to be able to um, capture and then weigh and measure, which will then allow us to further improve uh, our model. So the indications are then that the seals are responding to recent changes in the Bering Sea. And it's more important than ever to be monitoring all the ways, all the different prongs that I mentioned. As we've also shown, many of the most important things to monitor can only really be measured in the spring which is also when local residents need to be able to hunt marine mammals. We believe um, that this monitoring can be done without impacting uh, hunting success. Um, we've developed a number of protocols in order to ensure that we don't interfere uh, with hunting. As I mentioned, we don't exactly know yet where we will be uh, conducting our work, uh, but right now the ice is making it look like it's gonna be uh, more likely close to St. Matthew Island um, and not like the way the ice was in uh, 2018. Still, uh, we need to be able to be flexible and being flexible and still wanting to maintain our goal of not interfering with hunters requires plans to be put in place ahead of time and also communication. Um, we have developed these buffers, these hatched lines that I think that you can see um, in this image all around the coast. This, these buffers are locations where the Oscar Dyson and none of our small boats will, will ever enter. Effectively, they are 12 miles off of the coast everywhere and also 30 miles off of all of the identified whaling and sealing communities um, that you're seeing there. Uh, if we see, ever see whales or walrus, we'll avoid them and move to different locations. If we ever see hunters, we'll avoid them and move to other locations. But we won't always see you or whales or seals. We recognize the need for daily communications. We will be sending an email every day to every community that we have a contact uh, for uh, with our location at the time of sending uh, the email, our expectation of where we will be uh, the following day, what our plans are the following day, and what we did the day before. And we'll also be providing the most up-to-date uh, sea ice imagery that uh, we have access to. Um, we have access to high-resolution satellite images for our daily planning. Uh, we can often identify locations that will be good for our type of um, seal captures the types of ice that are good for seal captures using this high resolution satellite imagery. A lot of our imagery has the benefit of being able to uh, look through clouds as well. Um, again, an example of whatever our best ice imagery is for the day will be included in these, in these ice maps. Currently, I have about 230 uh, contacts that I'll send an email out to every day. 
Um, if you are, if you have ever received one of these um, emails from us in the past, then you are still on the list. If you're not sure if you're on the list and want to make sure that I send you an, a, an email, um, I'll, my email is at the end of this uh, presentation and I'll be glad to provide it later. Uh, please let me know your contact and I'll add you to our list. Uh, it's important, I think, to make sure that folks know that like hunters, we don't want to disturb the seals. Um, capturing a seal um, that's sleeping on the sea ice requires us to get up very close, which requires up to, us to be quiet and stealthy. Um, any disturbance, whether it's from the Oscar Dyson itself or our work or the drone would be impact our ability to effectively monitor uh, the seals. And in addition, the Oscar Dyson itself is designed to be quiet. It's um, one of the most acoustically quiet uh, fisheries research vessels in the world. It's meant to be quiet so as not to scare um, fish when they're doing their scientific uh, net toes. So in that respect, in terms of disturbance of seals, uh, we have uh, identical goals. One last thing uh, that I wanted to mention is every year uh, NOAA Fisheries puts out a, uh, a map like this. Um, the URL at the top is the location where you can find this year's map for 2022. This is a plan for all of the field work that folks at the Na National Marine Mammal Laboratory plan to be conducting um, in Alaskan waters. It includes locations of where we're working, um, as well as short descriptions of each project and the times of year where we plan to be operating there. Uh, this URL at the top will also give you a more um, informed information, a um, more involved uh, research plan for each one of those uh, field projects that I mentioned in the previous. Uh, page. This is the field plan for uh, the Oscar Dyson work that I just mentioned, um, but, uh, but all of the work um, that we do will have one of these research plans. So we're trying to maintain as much open communication as we can. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, Aaron will come up after this. This is my email, michael.cameron at noaa.gov. If you have any questions, uh, I'd be happy to hear them now or feel free to email me. And again, if you'd like to be on that uh, email list with daily plans of where the Oscar Dyson will be and what we'll be doing, uh, just send me an email. I will All right. end my slideshow. All right. Well, thank you. And does anyone have a burning question? Or you can always, if you're a little shy to speak up, you can put your questions down below, if you go in the bottom bar, you may see the word chat and a little cartoon bubble like a speaking thing. Click on that and you can type in your question as well. Dean Stockwell has his hand up. He knows how to run his Zoom computer better than I do. Go ahead, Dean, what's your question? First of all, nice talk, Michael. I really enjoyed it. I really appreciate what you guys are doing out there. But my question is regarding to, it's very difficult to assess the nursing platform stability as part of and its effect. So I, uh, I automatically think of prey. And I was wondering if you could at least tell me what the nominal prey items are of these seals and that can scat collected from the sea ice confirm prey items. And this would give you an idea if you're losing some major prey item for any one of these major groups. Thanks. Appreciate it. You bet. Uh, that's, actually, that's a really good question. And something I realize because you asked it, I forgot to mention, uh, we do collect scat on the ice and we do analyze the scat um, for prey. We've been doing that since we began in 2005. Um, that being said, we don't always get that much scat on the ice. Um, of an animal that we capture, but if we miss a capture, oftentimes a seal may poop on the ice and we'll collect that um, as well. So the short answer to your question is we do collect um, prey um, and the advantage of being able to collect, we do collect prey from prey samples from scat. One advantage of being able to collect them on the ice as opposed to um, 
other locations is that we know that this is the area where they were just uh, feeding. So we're able to get an indication of what they're feeding at that time. Unfortunately though, a lot of times, uh, at least in the spring, there's not a lot of, there's not as much feeding going on in the spring um, as for adult females anyway, uh, because often they're just on, they've already done their feeding, they're hanging out on the ice, converting their fat to milk and feeding their pup. All right, You're, you had a question in the chat box and that was, and thank you for that. Hopefully that answers that question. Yeah, he nailed it. Okay, all right, nailed it, well done. Okay, and Marilyn Myers asked, at what altitude do you fly the UAS to avoid disturbance of seals, to the seals? That's a good, that's another good question. Um, there's a lot of ways to answer that. Um, the first way to answer it is, what are we allowed to do from a regulatory standpoint? The lowest altitude we're allowed to fly over an animal is 50 feet. Um, the, highest anim the highest altitude we're allowed to fly in order to avoid other aircraft is 400 feet. So it'll be somewhere between those two. We though, like you mentioned, care about disturbance and we don't want to disturb the seal. What we've learned from a lot of our um, uh, aerial or manned abundance surveys is that different species respond differently they respond at different times of year in different sexes and based on the weather as well. So because we haven't flown this particular drone over any of the seals, I can't quite answer that question, but my suspicion uh, based on some of our captive work is that 100 foot will be our, uh, our sweet spot, somewhere between 100 and 100 feet. Essentially, we would like to fly as low as possible to increase our um, resolution of the imagery without disturbing the seal. All right, and another question in the chat is, because it has come up in several other talks, um, what information can you get from genomic sequencing, genomic sequencing of the scat? Would you ever be able to estimate mass from that? Mass of the seal? If the question is if we could estimate mass of the seal from using genetics in the scat if that's the if that's the yeah. question um i'm not i'm not sure i could i can think of a way right now that we'd be able to do that um what we what i do know folks have done is they've been able to look at um uh, genetic material in feces and in the water to be able to look at species diversity within the scat. Um, so you might be able to get an idea of um, the different species that were eaten, but I'm not, I don't know how you'd be able to do that to, um, to estimate the mass of the seal itself. All right, um, Peter wrote, okay, thanks. So well done. Any other questions for Mike Cameron? I know I've got a couple questions. So what's the name of that captive place that that ring seal was in? Uh, that was the Long Marine Lab at U University of California at Santa Cruz. Those people know how to feed a ring seal. Yeah. I don't know about you, but that thing was, yeah, they must charge we, a good admission. They got a lot of extra fish to put at that, uh, to put at the ring seal. Yeah. So that was a, a, they did a good job on that. Um, so we did that at, well, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, that's fine. It's going to maybe mess up your morphometrics if you think every seal is going to be that <laughs> that wide, but that's interesting. So, um, so you mentioned the populations. I know we had the population surveys back in 2011. We know that um, bearded and ring seals, not really based on their numbers, but those have been listed as in, uh, under ESA as not endangered, threatened. but threatened. threatened. Um, has there been any shift in the population? Have you been? We don't. I don't know if that, those numbers are available from 2011 or if there's whatever. But are you able to know if there is there a tr number wise? Are you there yet as far as being able to say anything so, up or down? And since then, um, abundance surveys is exactly what Aaron Moreland will be will be talking about. Okay, that's a lead um, in, I, I guess, to Aaron's talk. I don't. Yeah, I 
then I then I won't steal her thunder by telling okay. you about a friend. Or... <laughs> All right. And then one last request, one for you and one for the audience. The one for you, Mike, is if when Aaron gets going, if you could put in the chat your email address so people know uh, they can grab it and say, hey, I want to be on your list or maybe they don't want to be on whatever. Or and can you drop those <clears throat> those URLs in with the little something like here's the vessel base. Definitely. Thing. I'll do I'll that do would be awesome because those are awesome. Uh, that's really good. I've never seen, you know, the, the vessel base thing. That looks great. You guys are really um, changing it up and I, I very much appreciate it. I think everybody else will too. Um, and for the audience, my suggestion is save your good, good. Um, remember, we're going to give these guys a good mojo at the end because it's not easy to be a speaker, a public speaker. So hold your, hold off on the kudos until after Aaron so she doesn't get left out in your initial wave. Um, with that and no more questions, then we'll head over to you, Aaron, and tell us what you know. We're very interested. All right. Um, all right. I just started sharing my presentation. Is it appearing for everyone? Looks great. All right. Awesome. Um, Yes, thank you. That was a nice question. And um, I, <laughs> it, it's going to come a little bit later in the talk, but I will definitely get to it. Um, I want to start just by saying thank you for this opportunity. I'm really happy to um, be here with you all this evening and share uh, our, mo our most recent survey effort. Um, I'm also going to share some older results from our Chukchi and Bering Sea surveys. And um, before I get started, I want to acknowledge that we've been working with um, Fish and Wildlife Service for the past um, few to many years to include polar bears in our aerial surveys. And um, they've contributed to both the development of our camera system as well as um, air air aircraft support. So um, I'll be focusing mostly on ice seals today, but you will see a bear or two um, here and there. Okay, so the goal of our surveys is to, de is to determine the abundance and distribution of seals and polar bears. Um, these surveys have largely been international collaborations as shared resources. We all want to work together, together to um, better understand the changes that are taking place. In the Bering and Chukchi Seas, um, our Russian partners conducted coordinated surveys on, on their side of the line um, allowing uh, joint data analysis and also providing context for the estimates that we calculate on our side of the line um, uh, for when we're interpreting those uh, results. So um, these surveys in the Bering Sea took place in 2012 and 2013 and we surveyed the Chukchi in 2016 and we intended to survey the Southern Beaufort in 2020 but were delayed due to the pandemic. So um, all of these, but well, we were able to complete them um, last, last spring. All these surveys are instrument-based, so it's all a bunch of cameras that I'll show you in a minute. And um, this allows us to fly higher than traditional observer-based surveys. When we first started exploring how to um, survey these, these animals that are so broadly distributed throughout um, the frozen sea ice, um, we were using helicopters off of icebreakers and we had to fly at um, an altitude of 400 feet in order to differentiate species while we were looking out the window. And in moving to cameras, it allows us to fly um, at a thousand feet or higher and, um, and also faster. So um, it's a much safer approach for the folks in the plane um, and pro provides us with um, reliable, um, repeatable data analysis. So all of these surveys also have the potential to impact um, coastal communities. So we try to maintain communication as Mike has described um, with uh, interested groups within those communities. And um, I'm really interested in broadening that discussion as we look at ways to continue to improve our survey approach. So if you have ideas, um, whether or not you share them tonight, um, if you wanna um, shoot me an email. I'm, I'm happy to hear um, people's ideas and, um, and of course, concerns. So last spring, we conducted our surveys using a NOAA Twin Otter aircraft. 
And um, we, we fly at an altitude, as I mentioned, of 1,000 to 1,200 feet. And we're, because the cameras can run pretty, pretty fast, we're able to really optimize um, the range of the aircraft. So our survey speed is set based on whatever the most fuel efficient speed of the particular plane that we're using is. So for the Twin Otter, that turned out to be around 140 knots. And then in the upper right picture, you're looking at our cameras. So this is as if you're laying on the, on the ground, looking up through an open air belly port. And there's nine cameras there. We have three um, cooled thermal infrared cameras. And then uh, the middle row is um, our color cameras. They're machine vision cameras. They don't have a shutter, so we can't break the shutter, which is convenient. And, um, and then the ultraviolet cameras are um, the bottom row there. And we added the ultraviolet specifically to help improve our polar bear detection. We pick up um, seals uh, pretty reliably in the thermal imagery, but polar bears are a little bit more um, challenging in this regard. So we added the ultraviolet cameras to provide another um, stable uh, spectral band. We run, oh, so these cameras are arranged in such a way that they um, have overlapping footprints on the ground. So for any any spot in the image, you can look at that area in the color, in the UV, or in the IR. And um, we can we collect imagery continuously throughout the survey efforts. So we bring back a lot of images, like millions of images from um, a, a season of, of flying. So here's an example of what um, those thermal and color images look like. And um, you may have already spotted the two hot spots that are in the thermal image on the left. And you can see that those map to the seals in the paired high resolution color image on the right. And we have used a variety of programs to help find these hot spots in the thermal imagery. And I'm gonna share some of our efforts to improve this process with you. And then this is an example um, of a color image we collected this last spring. Um, with a polar bear in the center of it that um, has a little purple box around it. And um, this bear would have been really difficult to spot without the help of some of these other types of images. So you can see in the panel on the left, you have the color, in the middle you have the IR, which just is, it's a very low resolution camera, so it just gives you a big bright blob. Um, and then on the right you have the ultraviolet, which um, all all animals absorb ultraviolet rays, which is why we wear sunscreen. And, um, and that's done at a little bit more of a reliable, um, that's a little bit more reliable than, than infrared, which um, is, is measuring um, uh, heat. And so um, if a bear has just come out of the water, it's gonna be cooler, it's gonna put off a weaker thermal signature um, so we're hoping that the stability of the UV um, signal helps um, with our polar bear uh, detection. So as I mentioned, we collect imagery continuously on our surveys, with le which leaves us with millions of images uh, where we only expect to find a few thousand animals. So we originally used a cursory like uh, infrared, we called it a blob detector. <laughs> and um, then we would manually match the color image and identify species. But since then, we've been developing um, some smarter approaches and detection models using artificial intelligence. And these can actually um, find the hotspots, but they can also then look at the color imagery and identify the species of the source of that hotspot. So with our current models, we could set them up in a variety of ways. One of them is to trigger a full frame color image detection um, or image processing based on an IR detection. So the IR program finds a hotspot in the thermal image and then signals for the color model to run on the full color image. But there's a lot of um, false positives that come up in the color image. So this, can, um, this approach can be a little bit uh, it can, it can still narrow it down, but it can also have a kind of a high false positive rate. And then we can also just trigger that the relevant region of the color imagery be looked at, which is a little bit more of what we were doing. We would 
um, you know, the, the model would find the thermal um, hotspot, then we would look at the color image, match up the ice shapes, and then just look where the source of that hotspot was coming from. And so this is another way that we can um, align these models. And then the third option is to actually train the model on fused imagery, which allows the model to consider all of the data when it's, when it's trying to figure out what it is that we want it to be looking for. And this is likely um, the best approach where we'd have the lowest number of false positives, um, but it's also computationally intensive and it requires really precise um, pixel alignment. So we weren't um, totally sure that we were gonna meet the, the bar for that one. Um, so we set our models up in this kind of late fusion approach, triggering just the, the processing of just the relevant part of the color image. And we tested that during our um, surveys in the Beaufort Sea last spring. So our initial plan was to operate out of Inuvik, Dead Horse, and Ukyavik to cover the southern Beaufort polar bear subpopulation boundary. And, um, and then we also fly out to the US economic zone for, um, for our seal count counts while maintaining a 30 mile buffer around um, subsistence whaling communities. So you can see those in that image on the left, the map on the left, you can see the little um, buffers around the communities. When we postponed the season to 2021, we also um, eliminated, eliminated um, Inuvik as a base of operations due to the pandemic. Um, if you recall, there wasn't any crossing of the border between US and Canada um, at that time. So we covered the Eastern range as well as we could from Dead Horse. There was also increased concern about aircraft presence in the North Chukchi expressed from hunters. So we eliminated that area of our survey to mitigate any conflict with subsistence whaling activities. So our surveys took place between April 17th and June 11th. Um, our flights were out of Dead Horse and Utyavik. We flew 28 surveys that took about 151 hours in the air and we covered over 11,000 miles of effort. So that means the cameras were on and collecting images for that um, period of time and that distance. And um, another thing that we were able to do um, during this um, survey effort, primarily because the the, the aircraft that we were using was outfitted with like a search and rescue type camera system on the nose of the aircraft. And that allowed us to look really far ahead of the plane and identify animals before they were aware that the plane was coming. And so we did an experiment to look at how animals responded to the aircraft. And we ended up with over 160 trials um, toward that effort, which is really, um, a really unique opportunity to, to look at um, animal response to, to aircraft. And that work is still um, ongoing, but we'll be excited to share it all um, with the communities when we, um, when we have it completed. And then for polar bears, we um, conducted additional bear overflights to, to help us measure our detection rate for bears. And so that means that as we're flying along on our planned um, survey track, we're also looking out the window and the pilots are looking for bears. And anytime somebody saw a bear out the window, we'd um, change our effort type and go fly over that bear and ensure that we collected images. Um, so those kind of get held out um, from the primary data set. And we just had um, a student um, locally who reviewed all those images and found bears. And that allows us to test um, those bears become like a quiz for our models and we test it to see how well um, our process does at finding those, finding those bears. So as I mentioned, we, we were testing um, um, also this, this approach of using a color model. We have years of experience using thermal detection but we weren't really um, sure how well that color um, processing would, would work and how well that color model would work to find animals. And one of the things that our, um, that our system does, um, so those ca the cameras don't do this, but the cameras are all controlled by tons of computers that are on the, on the plane as well. And that 
computer system takes the images in and, um, and is able to map the images and also map any, um, any animals that the, that the model finds. So for the last four flights of our survey, we were able to run those models in real time. So as the images came off the camera, they went right into this image processing pipeline before they got stored on our, um, on our hard drives. And so when we landed at the end of the day, we had this information, a mapped, mapped locations of where we took our pictures and also um, where animals were found by this model and a score. So those numbers after the species is how well that model thinks it's doing at um, identifying that, that animal. Um, so this allows us to really evaluate how well that, um, that process works, which is pretty exciting. So we just completed, we just recently comp completed the review of over 30,000 infrared detections. So biologists looked at every source of those 30,000 detections. And then they also classified the species of over 4,000 animals from this survey effort. And we expect to have abundance estimates in the next few months. But I thought I would share the results from our Chukchi and Bering Sea surveys as they may also be a bit closer to home for folks that are um, dialed in tonight. The analysis is inherently complex due to the fact that the sea ice habitat is constantly shifting and melting during our survey window. So our st statistician actually models the distribution and abundance um, daily for the survey window using sea ice data. And we end up with a view of how the animals are using the ice as it exists at the time of that survey. So I'm gonna share some of those results with you. And I can see that we're running up on time. So, um, uh, Gay, just let me know if I need to uh, wrap it up more quickly here. So in the in the Czech GC, we were able to combine our Russian colleagues' data and our data and analyze them all together. So we're looking at estimates for the entire Czech G, as indicated by the map in the um, upper left corner there. So the top row of maps, um, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, but so this row of maps is showing you um, uh, the ice coverage of the survey area on three days of the survey. So April 7th, May 3rd, and May 31st. And then the second row shows um, bearded seal abundance estimates, and then also um, how they were using the ice that was available throughout that survey window. So the brighter colors show you um, the higher densities of animals. So this is down just north of the Bering Strait. And then you can see as the ice breaks up, um, they moved over into Kotzebue Sound and also just um, dispersed north. And then that, that bottom row is showing you the same thing for ringed seals. In the Bering Sea, we're just looking at um, US waters, our side of the, of the line there and the 2013 data. And you can see that bearded seals have a broad distribution, but a heavy presence in the central Bering. Um, ribbit and spotted seals prefer the southern ice edge, as we know, and ring seals occur in um, higher numbers in the, uh, in the north. Here you can see some of the estimates for both the western Bering Sea on the Russian side of the border and then the eastern Bering Sea estimates of animals in Alaskan waters for both of the years of this survey. So if you look um, at any one of, of, you can pick any animal, if you look at ribbon seals, um, between 2012 and 2013, we had a um, reduced um, abundance estimates for both um, the Western Bering and the Eastern Bering. And, um, and we saw that with all, all species. And to me, this really demonstrates the value of these types of international um, survey efforts. If we had only surveyed on our side of the border, it would have been very easy to um, um, and reasonable to think that animals might just be on the other side of the line and over in, um, in Russian waters. So, um, so this type of effort has been um, really important for understanding the context of our abundance estimates as well. So it's important, I'm getting to the trends, Gay. Um, it's important that we're able to identify trends in abundance as these animals respond to a changing Arctic and currently, we are clearly not surveying frequently enough to provide this type of really critical information. So this is generally due 
to the expense of these surveys and to some extent the coordination with international partners is um, complicates them a bit and obviously working with Russia right now is um, clearly compromised. So um, the earliest we could survey the Bering Sea would be next spring and a year or two later we'd hopefully be able to return to the to the Chukchi. So we're be, we were beginning conversations with our Russian partners um, but it seems um, unlikely that we'll be able to coordinate um, that work in the next year. So in an effort to make it easier to conduct these surveys while minimizing the impact to communities, we've been exploring a few ideas that I'm gonna share with you really quickly. And I'm just about um, wrapped up. The first is to use a faster aircraft to reduce our overall impact. Um, both of those Bering Sea surveys required two aircraft just on the US side. Um, a month and a half of, of presence and over 200 uh, flight hours. And um, NOAA has a faster plane that could complete the whole survey um, in just a few weeks, given a nice weather window um, and somewhere around 50 flight hours. It's much faster. It flies at about two, 200, 220 knots. The second is to um, get the information out of the survey effort and back to the people in a more timely fashion. So we're gonna to continue to work on these um, detection and classification models. And then the third is likely uh, a bit farther off, but it's I've always been curious to know if integrating unoccupied aircraft uh, might be a way to reduce our impact around communities. And we're, we actually have an opportunity right now to explore some of this. Um, we're working um, on a project with NASA to explore the feasibility of using unoccupied aircraft to survey harbor seals and stellar sea lines in the Aleutians. And um, this area has always been pretty challenging to survey due to the, due to the weather. So we've pared down our 200 pound um, camera system to a 30 pound um, payload that's shown in the upper left schematic there. And this system is being integrated into the Sierra B, which is that um, kind of medium, small, unoccupied aircraft in the um, upper center image. And, um, and then this, this particular platform can be operated by satellite control and can fly beyond line of sight. So we're planning five hour surveys of known seal haulouts around the near islands that um, we'll test uh, next fall out of Shemia. And I think I will wrap it up there and just say thank you so much for your time. I apologize for running over. Um, I, again, I'm grateful for the opportunity to meet with you all and curious to hear any of your ideas and, and questions. Thank you. I cannot hear you, Gay. Can other people hear? Hey, are you no. muted? Can't hear you. You're muted, Gay. Is that your internet? Mm. It might be the internet. Okay. Here, I'm good at reading lips. You want to? <laughs> <laughs> she said, You did a great job, Aaron. Fantastic. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see if there's any that questions. That is, in fact, in exactly here. what Gay would say. So. <laughs> Uh, if you maybe if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. Or I guess if, if Gay has something to say, she can put in the chat. Anybody else, I guess you can speak up. <laughs> so this is usually the time when Gay thanks both of you profusely and says this is really hard. Any exact oh she put it in the chat. I, I was exactly about to say the line, give the speaker some love because it's never easy to be a straight science speaker. Um, <laughs> Or a presenter, apparently. Let's give Gay some love. Too, for fantastic work. <laughs> you have Liz giving the clappy hands. Um, and you got great job, everyone, including Gay. Uh, we got a couple of questions. Gay, just not if you'd like me to continue my... my... <laughs> All right. Um, so, so thank you both. Uh, we got one question already. Um, any idea when we might see new density estimates for, for the seals? So those will be provided with, um, with the abundance. Well, 
those are sort of part of our abundance estimate. But um, uh, now that I'm thinking of it, I guess um, I'm not sure that we always report out um, densities specifically, but we can certainly we can certainly do that. Um, were you uh, thinking of any area in particular? Yeah, this is Marilyn Myers, and um, I, I work for NOAA and on the regulatory side, and we often have to estimate the amount of take that is going to occur from various actions, and that take needs a density estimate, and we're working with densities that were calculated back at, you know, around in the 1990s or 2000. And okay. so it's just really uh, problematic. And if yeah. we could get some new numbers, that would, that would be great. Um, I, was, I was afraid to hear what year you were going to say <laughs> there. And um, yeah, I can definitely, this is information we should definitely be able to be providing to you. So I will, um, I will look into how the best way to do that is. That would be awesome. And then a second piece to this question is in the Beaufort Sea. So there's, um, you know, more and more activity in the Beaufort, especially actually in the deep water. And I was wondering if you could filter out the results for the um, flights that occur over the shelf. So beyond the shelf, over the mm -hmm. deep water to know like just how many animals you see in that deep water area because you know most of the surveys and most of the information comes from the shelf area and for stuff that's happening out in the deep water it's I mean my my idea is that there's a lot fewer seals out there but we just don't have anything to solid to go on right now except you know, life history kind of characteristics. So that would be super useful. Yeah, we definitely see fewer animals out um, that far. Um, and especially early in the season, it felt like we were flying over the over the moonscape. Um, it was uh, really solid and um, there were not, we didn't see a lot of animals out there, but we did, we didn't, we did pick some up. So um, that's something we should be able to provide you um, as soon as as soon as the analysis is done, but in the meantime, I mean, I could I could definitely just send you um, uh, you know a map of where we saw animals. They wouldn't it wouldn't be an analysis, but um, but it might be um, a little bit of information to go off of. Yeah, that that would be great because we're flying blind right now, and okay. especially yeah, any seasonal. I guess this was all done in the spring, um, that was, that was and I. Be great. My point, Marilyn, is um, all the estimates and any density we give you would be during the on ice period, which we know will be quite different during the open water period. So if mm -hmm. the dis if the take or disturbance that you're interested in has to do with uh, shipping or fishing, um, those would be it. Those would not be in in ice areas. So there would have to be some adjustments. Or yeah, actually, one ex one exercise always occurs like right in the middle of winter, and so springtime might would be a good surrogate for that. All right. Well, thank you, Marilyn. And I'm back on crawled back on on the phone. It wasn't full internet outage. I don't know what's going on here at campus, but. I wasn't muted, now I am, so I don't get the double feedback. So first off, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Rob Kaler. Everybody give these speakers some love in the chat box. That is important, uh, as it is not easy to be a, a speaker and um, or, or hosting in Gnome, but that's okay. So uh, Dean Stockwell, you have your hand up. Do you have another question? Yeah, first of all, Aaron, thank you for the talk. I'd like to know what button you push to mute Gay. I'm a longtime friend, friend of hers, but I'd like to use that button sometime. So my question oh my. is several years ago, say 2015, uh, Utki Agvik reported uh, a lot of green coloration on seal fur. And my question to you is, can your imagery possibly pick up discoloration on the fur and I don't know how much analysis that would take, but that would be kind of a neat thing to know 
because I got to anal analyze some of that material. Secondly, I know from my work in the Antarctic that a lot of the penguin colonies were being uh, evaluated by satellite imagery from some of the government satellites. And I was wondering if you could make connections to do the same thing with seals in the north. Thank you very much for your talk. Thank you. Um, those are both super uh, interesting questions. Um, I, I was, we, I think we could look for green on on seals. You said that was around like 2015, which we didn't um, survey that year, but um, but it's something we could definitely. Uh, that would be an interesting thing to evaluate if there was um, some kind of what I imagine it was some kind of algae growth in the in the fur. Um, yes, it was a diatom growth in the fur of many of those seals. I got to, to analyze the fur material. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, there's definitely ways to ways to do that with the imagery that we have, and um, and then your your other question was um, oh regarding satellite imagery. Um, you know, I, I keep my eye on that. Um, and you know some of these things, some of these projects that are going on are able to assume you know what species they're they're looking at, um, uh, and I think with with the mix of species, um, I I don't think we're quite there yet, um, but I've I've seen some some uh, some kind of crazy future of satellites. Um, that indicates like there's going to be these sort of lower, um, you know, smaller cube satellites that are closer to Earth, that um, that might be increasing um, our what what we can see in images um, that they that they provide. So um, I imagine we'll we'll get there eventually, but um, but I think it's um, we're not quite there yet for differentiating these species that are all a little bit um, you know overlapping in there. Or quite a bit overlapping in their in their ranges. Thank you much. Thank you. All right, and also Marilyn put in the chat she'd like to be put on your list um, for update. All right. Any other questions? Either in the chat if you don't want to speak it up, or if you want to ask directly. Peter, you've got your hand up. Fire it off. All right, thank you both very much. Um, I, I have a question for each of you. I hope it's somewhat more intelligent than my scat question. Um, uh, unlikely, because I'm a little uh, 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 out of my depth here. One, um, to Aaron, you said that um, they would bring back millions of images and then a minute, a couple minutes later, you talked about a student reviewing all of the images. And so I'm wondering if, did people really hand review 900,000 images. Um, no. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, that was uh, misleading. We do, so we do do um, two sets of, of human reviewed color images. And one of them is, um, uh, one of them is a review of um, some subsample of the entire survey. So that might be um, 20,000 images. It's still a lot of images. I, <laughs> I'm not going to pretend like it's not. Um, and then uh, we had an intern who um, reviewed those images last summer to find seals that uh, it, independently of our system. And then we also had a student reviewing just the polar bear flyover areas, just those images to find the bears that we flew over. And that was a smaller, a smaller set of images. So that's an important part of our process, just so that we can ensure that the detection rate that's applied to the abundance model is what we're expecting it to be. Okay. Um, I, I'm glad for the intern that they don't have to review all 900,000. As you had started talking about it, I had written a note to myself, you know, ML question mark, but that's of course exactly what you're doing with it. So I don't need to ask um, details on yeah. that. Um, a question for uh, for Michael. Let's see if I can find it. Um, there was um, so if the if body condition is presumably being affected by the by 
for lack of a better term, climate change to some extent. Um, what I feel like there might be some skew in, um, I, I guess if you then, uh, um, so, so the, the notes that I have are using old records from aerial studies for lessons learned. Um, and I'm wondering if you might run into any issues or if you are hoping to find that, oh, compared to 10 years ago and the, and the UAS study surveys now, seals are shrinking. Is that what you're looking for or would that cause a problem to the model looking for something else? Um, I apologize. I'm not exactly sure what you're asking. I think you um, and me both, man. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, I'll say that our primary goal for the unmanned aircraft project is to be able to start a new database of similarly collected bits of information to help us um, start tracking more methodically. Um, estimates of body condition among these seals. We're looking for a method that uh, we'll be able to use now and going into the future that's reproducible, um, that we understand the biases for so that we can make corrections for if in the future we have um, you know, slightly better resolution cameras or, or whatnot. That's the primary goal of the unmanned aircraft project. Um, there's, a, there's a natural inclination to, to use earlier data from earlier years, 2007 and on, for example, um, as comparative, those are, those are useful. And we've done that, that study already, but um, it's because of the results of that study um, that we want to make sure that this is something that we can cheaply and easily, but effectively monitor uh, moving forward along with all the other work that we're uh, doing. Great, that's a great answer to a terrible question. Thanks very much. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Well, I see we have a caller, so I'm going to go directly to the caller. And the question is, um, one question came in over the side chat um, directly, and that was, and this will sort of maybe lead to my question, and that the question that came in over the side chat uh, was, what are the main dietary, t dietary items of adult seals? for the bearded ring spotted in ribbon. Sorry, I was muted there. Um, a little bit of a difficult, or it's a, it's a complicated question to answer simply. <laughs> um, as a general rule, we like to um, identify some of these species as generalist or specialists. Um, bearded seals are famous for um, being what we call benthic feeders, meaning that they feed, um, they go all the way to the seafloor. They tend to be in areas of rel uh, relatively shallow water, 200 meters or so. They go all the way to the, the seafloor bottom and they'll forage for uh, clams and crabs. That's in general. Uh, bearded seals, however, will take other species um, of uh, pelagic fish occasionally, you know, pollock and, and such, but that's not a primary prey of theirs. Uh, ribbon seals, in contrast, are known to be um, uh, much more deep water divers, at least uh, during certain part, at least during most of their parts of their year. Um, in those locations, uh, we have evidence that they're probably taking things like squid and very deep deep diving animals. Um, for the spotted seal, um, they're more mid winter, mid winter, they're more mid uh, water column feeders. Um, so they'll be going for various fin fish um, and ring seals, um, similarly, but much smaller uh, fish. It's, they all of the, Thanks, bro. It, as a general rule, if these animals encounter uh, any of these prey, they're not gonna turn their nose up at it. We find examples of crab in the stomachs of most of these animals uh, or the scats residue of squid in most of these animals. It's just uh, what, they're, what they're primarily eating is based on the part of the water column and the location where they're feeding at the time. All right, 
Hopefully that answered the question. For my question, which which was related to diet, so as you know, I think your survey you started in 2012 or so, or your survey working with the seals, catching them, right? Was it that right, 2011, or, or maybe I'm getting confused. With 2005 the is the first Regardless. time. Perfect. Okay, perfect. So right around, we had these two separated ecosystems, the Northern Bering Sea ecosystem, Southern Bering Sea ecosystem, separated by this barrier of cold water that was created and restored annually by the stable presence of the sea ice. We've lost that stable presence of the sea ice. This cold water barrier has got some real problems, and it has allowed, at least for us in the Northern Bering Sea, especially in the Bering Street region, whoo, we've seen this real, uh, we're sort of in this high pressure transition time where we've seen a big influx of large predatory commercially viable species from Southern Bering Sea, like Pollock, Pacific Cod, and a real, I would use the word collapse, um, of our things like Arctic Cod, the small fatty forage fish, hooligan, capelin, you know, that sort of thing down here, or up here. And in that flippy flop and this ecosystem in transition with the seals sort of having their own niche you know they're they're in the good days you know bearded seals were kind of eating this and that and this everybody had their own little niche like you you described which was great have you noticed from those i don't know how many scat samples you have but have you noticed anything from pre the barrier sort of we had a heck of a time with the ice in 17 18 and kind of, it just seems to continue. And I threw the the latest for the audience. I threw the ice map from from Rick Toman from March 22nd, which is the last one I have that gives you a little eye on the sky from uh, Tuesday, I guess. But anyway, have you noticed anything in the scat that sort of mimics this this uh, big change we've had in the fish? Um, unfortunately, the sample size of the scats that we're collecting at sea really isn't good enough to be able to make those sort of fine scale determinations um, or, you know, decisions. Okay. Uh, the work that the, the ADF and G has been doing, um, however, has a much larger sample size. They're able to look at stomachs, not just the scat. They're able to collect the, the prey that's actually inside the stomachs and not just the scat remains that, that we get on the ice. They've been doing it for decades, 30, maybe even 40 years, um, and they definitely have seen uh, trends, changes in prey um, related, they assume, to uh, ecosystem shifts. I'm not aware of one. I'm not as familiar with their work. Lori Quakenbush uh, would be perfect person for this question. I think that 2015, I think you said, would probably be too recent for them to have uh, noticed a shift in those data, but uh, it's it's very good data. This is again is data that is collected right by the hunters, um, and that's that's some of the best stuff that you can get. So um, I'd, I'd hesitate speculating more on that. I would probably speak to Lori. Right. Well, I hope that that is uh, that's interesting, and thank you very much on that. And. I guess that's all I wanted to say because that, that big transition. Oh, I guess seeing that there's going to be like a 10-year, I mean, I, I'm, I can appreciate you guys have an obligation to get the numbers of the populations. Is that 10-year gap, which it looks like it's going to be from 2012 to whatever, 2003 and from for this, are those, are those good enough for you guys or do you need, do you want to ramp that up more? For, for what you need to do. Well, uh, do you mind if I take this, Aaron? Is that a, okay? Um, as scientists, we're incredibly greedy. We always want more and more data because it allows us to know more and more and be able to tell more and more. Um, uh, with more surveys, more frequently, we'd be able to, to track changes a little more closely and there are statistical methods which would then allow you to compare or combine data from multiple surveys of the same location um, into a sort of larger analysis that would allow you to do a better job at identifying trend. Um, the 
these surveys that Aaron are talking about are the first range-wide surveys ever conducted for ribbon seals. These surveys that Aaron are talking about are the first synoptic large-scale surveys um, across Russian waters and US and parts of Canada, Canadian waters that have ever been conducted. So her, her graph her, showed one, one point um, and there's really not good information to put on the left-hand side the, to show any other trends. So yes, we would love to be able to have um, more surveys that we could conduct. We're in a way statutorily required to be able to con conduct these surveys um, somewhere on about an eight year period. Um, right now we're on okay. about um, a eight to 10 year planned cycle, but we're only talking about the second survey ever um, of, of most of these waters. Right. So um, would we like to do better? Absolutely. Uh, COVID was a problem and you know, funding, of course, is always a problem. Right. It's just, you know, I'm, we're always hungry down here to know how, how they're doing because of the, the pressures on, you know, for, for the uh, ecosystem here. So we're just seeing that. And it's, uh, so we wish you well and very much thank you both for your presentations. Uh, that was awesome. Plus a little polar bear bonus. So that was nice. In with ice seals. I like seeing NOAA and Fish and Wildlife logos on the same page. It's so rare, and yet it's so important. So um, so thank you both. Any other questions? Nothing in the chat. You're getting some kudo. That's good. You feel free to throw them in there. For next week, so on the night of the 31st, there's a, there's been, of course, a great interest, and in, we've had some straight sciences regarding uh, harmful algal blooms. And we're going to have Kathy LaFay with the NOAA Northwest Fisheries Science Center, and she's going to be giving the results <clears throat> from her 2019 work, which is a very warm year for this region. And she has a, uh, a very large study statewide, but she's working with walrus. Uh, she's getting data from subsistence harvested walrus in this region regarding harmful algal blooms during a warm year and what the presence and frequency was for saxitoxin in their, uh, in their system, in their diet. And she's also going to be talking about uh, bowhead specifically from subsistence harvested bowhead up in the north in Utqiagvik. So it will be a very interesting uh, presentation on the anom anomalously warm 2019 and some of the harmful algal bloom uh, results, both from the animals themselves and from a greater uh, research effort offshore.